Welcome to Surgery Talks. In this podcast, I will be talking about bile duct injury and will focus on the human factors that have been shown to be the root causes of more severe types of injuries. I will then list and explain the strategies to minimize the risk. Bile duct injury still remains common compared to the era of open cholecystectomy. The overall rate of bile duct injury of all types in most large population-based studies of laparoscopic cholecystectomy has been found to be around 0.4%. One in three surgeons will cause the injury during their working lifetime, and bile duct injury has a major detrimental effect on the patient's physical and psychological well-being, affecting their quality of life considerably and still remains a common reason for medical legal claims. It is worth remembering that the majority of injuries are discovered postoperatively in cases described by the surgeon as otherwise straightforward. Even experienced surgeons are not immune from causing the injury, and the injuries fall into a number of set patterns implying common underlying reasons. The injury is typically caused either due to poor technique or due to wrong identification of the anatomy. Poor technique includes causing bleeding intraoperatively, misuse of clips and electrocautery, and traction injuries. Poor technique tend to manifest more in the presence of other findings such as acute cholecystitis and obesity. However, the majority of severe injuries are due to non-technical causes. In many of the severe duct injuries, the root causes appear to be spatial disorientation and confirmation bias. In the classic spatial disorientation, the surgeon mistakenly sees the bile duct as a cystic duct. This occurs when the Hartman's pouch is retracted towards the liver and not laterally as it should be. And as a result, the cystic duct and the bile duct become aligned. Once the bile duct is mistaken as the cystic duct, the surgeon will subconsciously look for evidence to confirm rather than refute that his findings are correct. This is known as the confirmation bias. The optical illusion thus created makes the bile duct appear as a cystic duct and the bile duct is clipped and transected. The surgeon then continues the dissection up towards the liver for completing the gallbladder dissection only to come across a second structure, the common hepatic duct, which is in turn transected. So what are the surgical rules to follow to avoid bile duct injuries caused by misidentification? Rule number one during surgery is to bear in mind that you may be wrong in your assumptions about the anatomy. The easier the gallbladder appears to you, the more worried you should be that you may be looking at an optical illusion. Remember, many major injuries are detected postoperatively in apparently easy gallbladders. The surgeon should not assume anything and should be consciously looking for evidence that refutes what he or she believes in. In other words, you look for reasons why the cystic duct that you are dissecting could be the bile duct. This is not easy and goes against the natural tendency of looking for evidence that the cystic duct is indeed the cystic duct. Rule number two is to have regular timeouts to look out for key anatomical landmarks to reorientate yourself. This is achieved by focusing the laparoscope out every so often and to look for the liver sulcus, duodenum, portohepatis, falciform ligament, and liver. The timeouts need to be regular and frequent. Again, this is important even if the gallbladder anatomy looks straightforward since you may be missing or misreading the anatomy. Rule number three is to achieve the critical view of safety. For this, the aim is to dissect the hepatocystic triangle so that you have only two structures going into the gallbladder. Importantly, the dissection needs to be extended for at least a third up the posterior gallbladder wall attachment to the liver 
to ensure no structures go back into the liver. Rule number four, safety first, total cholecystectomy second. In other words, if you cannot confidently achieve the critical view of safety, then a bailout strategy is the correct action, which means performing either a subtotal cholecystectomy or a cholecystostomy and abandoning the idea of a total cholecystectomy. In subtotal cholecystectomy, the anterior wall of the gallbladder is retracted, is resected, stones removed, and gallbladder bed is drained. Some surgeons attempt to suture close the cystic duct from inside once the anterior wall of the gallbladder is removed. It is essential that you place drains into the gallbladder area even in the absence of any visible bile leak, since once the inflammation subsides, the cystic duct could open up and start leaking bile postoperatively. Often a number of drains are placed, including one to the liver bed, one to the foramen of Winslow posterior to the porta hepatis, and the other placed under the liver laterally. Most low volume bile leaks following subtotal cholecystectomy subside spontaneously. But if there is large volume or prolonged period of bile leak, you may consider an ERCP and stenting. This usually results in a rapid resolution of the bile leak. So what should you do if you find yourself in the unfortunate situation of having caused a bile duct injury during surgery? Two things are required. First, you should not attempt to do any further dissection as this will either extend the injury or devascularize the bile duct further. Conversion to open surgery is not indicated either. Instead, you should communicate your concerns with the theater team clearly and have a timeout or even descrub. Second, you should discuss the problem with an experienced HPV surgeon. The evidence suggests that the best surgical outcomes come from repairs done at the time of the index operation by an experienced HPV surgeon. The HPV surgeon is very likely to perform an intraoperative cholangiogram before deciding on the type of repair. In most cases, the choice of repair is a hepaticojejunostomy. However, you may have to transfer the patient to a tertiary center if no expertise exists locally. The abdomen needs to be adequately drained prior to any transfer and clear operation notes detailing all the operative events should be recorded in the patient's medical files before the transfer.